but you guys can Appreciate all it, all see that we're we're shuffling and and bustling up in the Pinedo household this morning. Amen. Well, uh, before we get started, uh, why don't everybody stand up for a second and move around a little bit and act like you know somebody in your room and stretch it out a little bit and get comfortable. Amen. You know, I think sometimes we get on Zoom, we get a we get we get too comfy in our house a little bit. We start to sink into that couch a little bit more. You know, I saw the 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 Cooper household or the Copper household. I don't know which one is it, Courtney. The Copper household. They they they're they're six couches deep. They might they might have fallen asleep on me already. Amen. Um, you know, a, as you can see, uh, we have a, a a few new faces on our Zoom. Uh, I don't know if, if if somebody can come up here and change the views so I can point it out. I I, I don't I don't know if that's possible. Um, no worries. See, this is why you have an AJ Pinedo in your life. Because when you don't know how to do something, he always knows how to do it. Amen. But you know, as we can see here, we we got this uh this 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 page over here. We have some people who are not visiting with us, but there's there's two young ladies who their cameras aren't on. But they're going to be joining us here in the West Super Region. Uh, their names are Carla and Camila uh, Martinez. You can uh, you can see their photo. It's it's the photo with three people in it. Amen. Uh, as well uh, in the in the the Copper household. I don't know if she's on there, but I think Tia's in there somewhere over there. And, you know, Tia, she's back. That's awesome, and, and we, we're really grateful to have her back. She's going to be leading the West Hills region with our dear brother, Chris Riley. Uh, as well, uh, we want to, I want to take a moment to just thank our dear sister, Taylor Burns. We had an awesome party for her on Wednesday. We were able to send her off. She's now in the South Super region. So please be uh, praying for Taylor and with her transitions. Please be praying for the West Super region and all of our transitions as well. But as well, uh, someone that's pretty near and dear to my heart is here on Zoom tonight, uh, tonight, today. Uh, my mom is here. Uh, you can see her photo, amen. And so I'm grateful that she decide, that she's here with, with us this morning. But today what we're going to talk about is, is a continuation of last week's sermon. So last week, uh, or two weeks ago at this point, uh, AJ started a sermon titled Lord of All. And AJ he got through the first point and he said, you know what? There's just too much here. I can't finish it all. Amen. And, and you know, God, God, or maybe the Holy Spirit, whatever it was, gave him the, the tea, said, hey, all right, AJ, we've got to let Chris and Quentin talk about the rest of this. Amen. Uh, which I'm very grateful for because uh, today what we're going to talk about is, is Jesus Lord of all. You know, I have some questions for you this morning. Is Jesus Lord over everything in your life? You know, is he Lord of your finances? I really appreciate Bernie sharing her heart saying, you know, there were some instances in my life where it was hard for me to make decisions, financial decisions. But the fact that you trusted God, and you can always see in someone's life when they trust God with their finances, that it decide that, that it, it quickly and it, and it rapidly moves. And God is so intentional in that way. But is he the Lord of your decisions or only the ones you allow him to be? I think sometimes we get into this mindset that, that Jesus, I'm going to allow you to make decisions in my life that are comfortable. But as soon as it starts to push my boundaries a little bit, no, you can't be Lord over that. You're not allowed. You're not allowed to touch that area of my life. You know, God, God, you're Lord of everything until you want me to go and do something like move. Lord, you, you, can, you can have everything until I have, to make a, have to, until I have to do something that I didn't sign up for. Uh -oh. Ooh, up, bro. Well, you know, it's interesting because Jesus commanded you to make him Lord over everything. Yeah. Not just some things. But today, I have another question for you. Is Jesus Lord of your heart? Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 36. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, we see it says this. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So first things first, we see from this verse that we have to understand 
that we ought to take a personal responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus. That our sin is what killed Jesus. And then he says, God has made this Jesus Lord and Messiah. So God has put Jesus in your life not only to be your Savior, but to be the Lord of your life. And you know what? When you talk to people about that, a lot of people don't struggle with the Savior aspect. A lot of people you talk to, they're like, oh, I want to be saved. That's awesome. Let, let me be saved. God save me. But nobody will say this out loud, but in their hearts, they can often feel like, but I don't want to make him Lord. I don't want God to, to have dominion and power over my life, and especially their heart. But it's interesting that when AJ shared and talked about all of this in the series, he talked about how Jesus is the Lord of your mind. You know, I, I appreciated that because one of the things that, that I can forget is that Jesus makes it a command that we need to take command of every thought. That every thought needs to be obedient to Christ. And I remember re when he preached that sermon, I was convicted. I said, man, how have I been doing at making Jesus Lord of my mind? And I've been really able to reflect on that and, and, and take it and, and really work it in my life. And I hope you guys have been able to do the same as making Jesus the Lord of your mind. And then AJ said, bro, I want you to preach the, the point about making Jesus Lord of your heart. And I think for me, it can be very easy for me to be very heartsy. I like to give my heart to things. But man, is it easy for me to give my heart to areas of my life? Is it, is it easy for me to go 100% in everything that I do? And so that's what I want to talk about today. Come on, brother. But this morning, the title of our lesson is this, Lord of your heart. If you want to make it a little bit more personal, Lord of my heart. Amen. Come on, Quentin. Good stuff. But it's very funny. Whenever somebody thinks of the word, the word heart or give your heart to something, it always, it always goes back to their emotions. You know, I think of when people say, give me your heart, sometimes it's romantic involved, right? You yeah. see these romantic comedies where these, these women will do these grand gestures. They'll move across the world for a guy. And then the guy's like, not interested in her. And you see her break down. And she decides that all men are terrible and she's never going to find another guy. And then she goes and finds another guy and it all works out in the end. Amen. Amen. And then sometimes you'll see it with these with, with men. They find the woman of their dreams. And then she breaks their heart. And you know, guys, we're not as, as vocal with our emotions, so it's a lot more like, no, I'm fine. No, she didn't hurt my feelings. And then inside, you're like really hurting. And you don't want to admit it. So brothers, it usually takes us about like a year when it takes like a sister like a month to get through. Because brothers just won't admit that they're hurt. You know, we can be kind of prideful in that way, amen. But today I want to talk about three different groups or three different people, three different areas that we need to give our heart to in the month of June. Come on, bro. You know, we need to be consumed in June. You know, we talked about that, 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 that in this region we want to be consumed with, our, with having sizzling faith. But... It starts with giving your heart to something. Because if you can have faith in it, you're going to give your heart to it. Amen? So I'm going to go through three different areas that we need to give our heart to. Point number one, give your heart to God. Let's go to Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. Hey Amen. I'm over here looking at the screen like, wow. Psalm chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. 
I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Man, it's a, this, is, this scripture is convicting. You read this and it starts off by saying, I will give thanks to you. This is a man who, who, who's willing and understands who his heart belongs to. His heart belongs to God. And David continues. He says, Lord, with all my heart, I tell of your wonderful deeds. How are you at talking about God's wonderful deeds? How have you been in the last week, the last month, the last year at proclaiming to those around you, those in your life, what God has done for you? Because if we're being honest, God has done far more than you ever could deserve. God is doing far more than you could ever imagine. But how good are you at talking about those wonderful deeds? Because it says here, I will, it says here with all my heart, David told of God's wonderful deeds. He says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Now let's look at another scripture in Psalm chapter 103. Psalm chapter 103. We see another awesome psalm in verse 1. In, so, in, psalm, verse one uh, in psalm 103, verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Do you guys see the benefit that God brings to your life? Or do you just look at the way that Bob kind of talked about it earlier, that God is this, you know, self-help. He's going he's gonna to help you out. I really appreciate Bob sharing his heart with us this morning. I was, I was looking over at Courtney like, wow, I, gotta, I might have to have Bob come up here and preach. His brother, his brother was sharing his heart. He did an amazing job. But I found a, a, a version of this, of this verse that, that really spoke to me even a little bit more than the NIV. Uh, I know some of the sisters probably are going to be fired up about this, but I, I was looking in the Passion Translation. <laughs> and it says this, with my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my innermost being. I bow in wonder and love before you, holy God. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. And could I ever forget the miracles of kindness you've done for me? Wow. When you look at it in the Passion Translation, it, it, it gives you some insight. Especially when you read through the book of Psalms, you're like, man, this brother David had a, had a deep heart. I can learn a thing or two from this guy. But it starts off, it says, with my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you. How have you been in going before God with that type of reverence? With everything that you have? Have you been giving God everything? Or have you been giving God your scraps? To give God your whole heart, it, it requires dedication. It requires time. It requires you to get uncomfortable. If you look at any relationship, man, I think about the relationship that I had with my parents as a kid. When my parents, when I wanted to talk to them, they better listen to me. And give me their undivided attention. I, get, I, I love living with the Pinedos because I get to see it with Rosie and Leo. Man, AJ will be like, Rosie's trying to talk to AJ. And, 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 and Rosie's like, Dad, are you listening to me? Dad, are you listening to me? And AJ's like, I'm listening. And she's like, no, you're not. You're on your phone. Listen to me, Dad. <laughs> and AJ's just like, I am listening to you, Rosie. And it's like this whole little back and forth. I'm like, wow, that's how I was when I was like Rosie's age. I remember talking to my dad, like, Dad, are you listening to me? And my dad would be like, I am listening to you, son. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not looking at me. But isn't it funny that 
We do that with God. God, are you listening to me? God, are you listening to me? And God's like, I am listening to you. Are you listening to me? Because sometimes we like to get slick with God. God, you need to do more for me. Maybe we don't say it. But if we're being honest, some, I know I've had those moments in my life where I thought it. Like, man, God, what is, what is going on here? You're not doing enough. I need more. And God wants you to have that deep relationship with him. He wants you to feel comfortable enough to talk to him. He wants you to feel comfortable enough to come and be real with him. But are you giving him your whole heart? The way that David describes all your heart, all your life, all your inmost being, that's a different level of giving one's heart. I want us to go back to the basics a little bit here, family. Let's go to Psalm chapter 119. You know, a lot of you guys may hear, have heard this verse before. And you guys go, oh, yeah, seeking God, heard it before. And I think that there, there's a lot of verses that absolutely we've heard. The question is not, have you heard it? The Bible has never been a book just to read. The Bible has always been a book that you need to read and apply. And so if you know it, but you are not applying it, then what's the point? You're better off going and reading some book from some motivational speaker in the world. Because they'll tell you a lot of good things, a lot of get-rich-quick schemes. They'll tell you everything your heart desires, but you won't change. But in Psalm chapter 119, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all of their hearts. You know, another way to look at the word blameless would be to say this. Blame, uh, or happy are those whose ways are free from sin. Happy are those who keep his standards and seek him with all their heart. You know, a lot of us claim to give our hearts to God. And we claim that we're doing everything in our power. I think in my life, I've made a lot of lofty claims. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. My mom's on this call. You can probably ask her some of the lofty claims I've made. But. Just because you make a lofty claim doesn't mean that that actually is what you're doing. And I love this scripture because it says you will only be happy when you're free from sin. You will only be happy when you live up to God's standards. Family, God's standards are, are very easy to find. And he doesn't, he doesn't beat around the bush. That's what I love about God. He's not, this, he's not the type of God who's like, well, maybe I want you to do this. Maybe I want you to do that. No, God's like, no, do this and don't do that. I love what, I love what Bob said. He said, he said, peanut brain. I was like, I'm, hey, Bob, I'm with you, bro. I was like, I feel like I have a mustard seed brain. I, I might be lower than Bob, amen. I love when the Bible's like, hey, do this. Don't do that. Because then I can just be like, I get it. I can't, I can't deny it. But it doesn't mean that it makes it any easier to follow it. Just because you know something up here doesn't mean your heart's behind it. Right. Shots fired, bro. Come on now. And that's why God said what he said in the, in the second part of that verse. He said, and seek him with all their heart. That's why that part is there. Because we all are really good at being like, I get it. But some of us are not that good at being like, I'm with it. Yep. Yep. This morning, I, I want to challenge you. If you get it, but you're not with it, maybe you're not living up to that second part of that verse there. You know, family, I, I really want to call us that it, it, it's time this summer, starting today, to start back, to get back to giving God our whole heart. And sometimes I think I, I give these challenges or, or people come up here and give challenges and people in, in the congregation go, I'm already doing that. 
Well, I'll come back to you in a minute. But if you feel like you need to get back to giving your whole heart, then amen. God is always ready, willing, and able to have you come back to him. That's what's so great about the God we serve, is that God is not a God who's like, hey, I'm not, I'm not ready to talk. God is the most forgiving person in the whole wide world. But as well, guys, here's some of the ways we need to get back to giving God 100% of our heart. We need to get back to giving God 100% of our heart in our worship. You know, far too often in, cong- in service, I see that there's about 10, 15, 20% of the congregation that's singing. And I keep being told, man, bro, I, I want to give my whole heart, but I, I go up there and I feel like nobody's giving me their heart back. I, I just want to point something out to us here, family. You singing at Sunday service is not for the song leaders. You singing at Sunday service is not for you. You singing at Sunday service is your worship to God. That's all. Do you guys think that I want to be singing every Sunday? No, I'm a terrible singer. I don't like singing. But that doesn't mean that I have an excuse to not worship God. (laughs) Every week, brothers be like, bro, you got to come up and be a song leader. I'm like, bro, we are trying to encourage the congregation. Amen. I know my place. Amen. But as well, we need to get back to giving God 100% in our devotion. How is your times with God then? Is your time with God something that you fit into your schedule? Or is it something that you do to prepare for the day? A lot of the times I think we do this thing where we go and have our times with God and we read a a set amount of scriptures and we pray for a set amount of time. I don't know about you guys, but my days are not the same. I don't need to do the exact same thing every day. God is not a part of your routine. It is a relationship with God, not something you check off of your spiritual checklist. You know, devotion and a relationship takes time and effort. To give God your whole heart means there's going to be some days where you start your quiet time, your time with God, and you start reading your Bible, and you go, oh, man, I'm going to be here a while because my heart is jacked up. And then there's going to be other mornings where you open your Bible and you go, amen, I'm fired up. And then there's, there's been some times where I read like two verses, and I was like, let's go see, what I, let's go see what's happens." I mean, I was fired up. I was ready to go. And then there's other times I'd read like four, five, six chapters, and I was like, I'm, I don't feel close to God at all. I need to go pray because I'm struggling. But even in your prayer time, there's some mornings when you just wake up ready to fight. You're like, Lord, I'm ready. And then there's other mornings when you wake up, and you're like, Lord, help me. I need to, I need to go talk to God for a little minute. You know, I've, I've, seen some, I've seen some of those days with brothers, and I'm sure some of the brothers have seen these days with me where I'm, hey, bro, I can't talk right now. I need to go pray. There's a couple times on campus with Courtney. Courtney came to talk to me. I was like, hey, I'm going to be honest. I need to go pray because I'm not in the right head right now to talk to anybody. You need to be humble enough to admit that you may need extra time with God. That's okay. But there's also days where you may feel like you're ready to go. Only you know that. That's the funny thing about the heart. Nobody can see your heart. We can assume. We can make observations. But no one knows what's inside of your heart. Only you know that. And only God knows that. So if those are the only two people who know where your heart really is at, why wouldn't you spend ample, and I mean enough time, to get your heart right with God every single day. Right. 
The third thing is we got to increase our, our, our heart level at seeking him. And part of the ways that we seek God is by going above and beyond for God and being willing to let God move us, but doing it with a cheerful attitude. I think far too often we get into this mindset where we think if we, if we go and we make a decision, even if it's with a, a, a really messed up and sour heart, that God's going to be glorified by that. God doesn't want you to do anything if your heart's not in it, family. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to make a decision with a, with a, with a really terrible heart, and, and it just went terrible. And then there were some times where I had some, like, really dumb plans. You can ask Courtney, really dumb. And God was like, but your heart is with me. I got your back. That's the God we serve. We serve a God who wants us to be with him 110%. Now, AJ might tell me that's not possible. There's only 100%. You can't be 110%. But you get what I mean. Amen. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And Come on, Quentin. Preach your word, This bro. is a scripture that I remember when I was first coming around, the uh, ICC really spoke to me. It says this, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Uh, the Lord, uh, to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The scripture really spoke to me because when I first came into the kingdom, I went through probably one of the most traumatic times of my life. And for those of you who don't know, when I first came into the kingdom, I was engaged. The reason I started studying the Bible was because I was in premarital counseling. And then a bunch of my sin, a bunch of my impurity in my heart, in my mind, in my life all came to the forefront. And I was exposed. And that relationship ended. And for a very long time, my biggest fear was losing a relationship, especially that one. In fact, I remember talking to my mom and I remember talking to Jay Shelbreck and I remember saying, I just, I just can't give this up. I just, I can't seek God if he takes this away from me. And you, you know, I just love God. Because <laughs> God will, will take away the very thing that you say, if he takes it away, see what happens. As AJ would say, God's a little gangster. He's like, watch. Watch what I'm about to do. Let's see what happens. And you know what's funny? about God is in that time of my deep sadness and my deep sorrow and my deep anguish, I prayed to God. And I love this scripture because this scripture says that God is able to over, go over our understanding. Yeah. Yeah. My tiny little mustard seed brain couldn't comprehend what God was doing. I now see three years later that God was preparing my heart for somebody who he intended for me to date and he intended for me to lead and he intended for me to be able to lead a ministry with. And that is Courtney Barnett, obviously. But it's interesting because it simply says in the beginning of this scripture, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Nowhere in that scripture does it say that God's going to make your life easy. People get this mixed up. They go, how can I rejoice if my life is hard? <laughs> what? Well, here's, here's the greatest answer. It goes, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 
So how can I rejoice even when my life is hard? By going to God, who was the source of all this in the first place. He's the one who brings joy. He's the one who allows you to, to be unanxious. You know, it was brought to my attention by Courtney recently that uh, apparently some people look at me and they go, wow, Quentin doesn't freak out that much. And I go, I just, I mean, I have God. What's the point of freaking out? And, you know, sometimes I say that and people think that, like, I, I say it as, like, a joke. Like, I, no, I genuinely mean it. If you have God and you're giving him your whole heart, then what do you have to be worried about? It's not, and that's what I love about God, is that he can take some simple-minded white kid from Wisconsin and, 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 and just break it down to that simple for me. Maybe it's not that simple for you. Maybe you're a little bit more like Courtney, who needs the, her 10 steps and amen. That's awesome. You know, you know Courtney could, could explain her process to you, but I know for me, it's very simple. That God gives joy. And if I seek God with all my heart, I know I can always be joyful. And I know I never have to worry. And I know I never have to be anxious because the Bible says it. Why would Jesus or why would God write something in the Bible that he didn't mean? If you believe that the Bible is 100% true, then why do you have to worry? You don't. Just give God 100% of your heart. Amen? Amen. You know, but here's the thing, family, is that God doesn't want a surface level relationship with you. God wants a deep, meaningful relationship. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10, we see something that is, is very easy for a lot of us to overlook, and that is the, the Berean church. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10 through 12, it says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Family, Jesus made it very clear that the, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you look at this scripture and if you look at the qualities that the Bereans had that deemed, made them noble, it says that they eagerly examined every day. They had eagerness, they examined the scriptures, every, and they did it every single day. You could break that down to soul mind and strength because if you're eager to do something it's coming from your heart if you examine something you have to use your mind to examine something and if you do something every day it requires a great deal of strength yeah. so my question for you is are you a berean only in when you read your scriptures or are you a berean in everything are you a berean with your time are you a Berean with your gifts? Are you a Berean with your heart? It's simple, family. God doesn't want a half-hearted worshiper. John chapter 4, verse 23. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 23. It says this, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his, his worshipers must worship Him in the Spirit and in the truth. Family, God doesn't want you to simply be obedient to His Word. He wants you to live life to the full, 
while following in obedience to his word. That's what God has always wanted. He's always wanted you to give him your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole strength. And that's where you find the well-rounded worshiper that finds joy in all this. Family, if you're not finding joy, maybe you're missing one of those areas. Maybe you've been for far too long, maybe you've been far too analytical, and you're missing out on the joys of having a relationship with God. Or maybe, family, it just comes down to this. Maybe your relationship with God is far too inconsistent. Family, if you have a relationship that you say is deep, but you spend every single time you say you're going to spend time with that person, every other time you cancel on them, that person's not going to be close to you. If every single time you spend time with them, you're half-hearted in it, they're not going to feel close with you. If every single time that you talk to somebody, you don't listen, you don't try to help them in their time of need, they're not going to feel close to you. If you wouldn't feel close to somebody in the world, why would you expect God to feel close to you? Why would you expect to feel close to God? It's, it, and, and, and it's really that simple, guys. God is not that complicated. He doesn't want to make your life extra hard. He loves you so much that he's already given you examples of what you want. And then God just goes, all those things you want, I'm it. I'm the ideal bachelor. For guys, I don't know what you guys would be looking for. The ideal woman, that's that's God too, amen? (laughs) But like I said earlier, Maybe you feel like your relationship with God is on point. So maybe part, point number two is more geared towards you. How is your heart towards yourself and towards the family? Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Talk with it. It says this, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to anyone, or be, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual ver- fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. How has your heart been towards the family this week? Have you been down in the dumps or have you been zealous for God? You know, I want to lift up the Young Singles Bible Talk. You know, about two weeks ago, uh, Courtney was there. We did a we did a Bible talk and we did a little role playing on how we're gonna share our faith and it was all fun. And then God put it on my heart. You know what? We need to discuss some some family things. <laughs> and one of the things I brought up to the group is that we need to be better about sharing our faith. Right. And I want to give credit to uh, Marissa who's right there. I want to give credit to to Vanna, who's somewhere over there. I want to give credit. I want to give a, a, a shout out to our dear sister Regina. This this power trio really took a hold of that that challenge, and 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 Marissa and Vanna and Regina they've been in the chat. Da-da-da. You know this girl's open. This girl's open, and I was like, wow, these girls are on fire. But then I thought about it, and I go, man. What makes them so special? And although I love these women, they didn't do anything that special. And what I mean by that is they simply just lived out this scripture. They simply loved each other enough to challenge each other. And it's very interesting because their spiritual zeal because of the love that was shown to them went through the roof. 
And it's very interesting at times that we allow our spiritual zeal to be the reason or the lack thereof for why we do things. But it's very, sim it's very simple here. It says never be lacking in zeal. I don't know about you, but the word never is a pretty definite word. It's not very easy to go, but what about? No, it never means never. Amen. But as well, I want to focus on this word. It says, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. You know, I love uh, Leo. Because this little dude knows how to cling to things. Every now and then, Leo will come up to me and he'd be like, come here. And I'm like, what's up, Leo? He's like, I'm going to climb on you. And I'm like, all right, cool, buddy. And he climbs on me like a little tree. And I'm like, man, this kid knows how to cling to me. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Can't, I can't shake him off. But is that, does that describe you? Are you clinging to the things that are good in your life? Or are you running to the things that are evil? I think far too often, we, and we surround ourselves with things that we know aren't good for us. And then we're down in the dumps. Well, why do you think that is? Because you're not surrounding yourself with what God intended for you to be surrounded by. One of my favorite scriptures is found in the book of 1 Corinthians. Like I said before, I, I'm, I'm a man who does not like to mince words. So I like it when the Bible talks straight to me. In verse 33, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 33, it says this. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some among you who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. I don't know if you guys know this, but 1 Corinthians was written to a church. Yep. And I don't know if you guys know this. This is church. We're in a church service right now. Amen. So in case there was any confusion on Zoom, this is a church service. Amen. Amen. But it says that we need, we should not be misled that bad company corrupts good character. But just as bad company corrupts good character, so does bad things. So do those things in your life that you know you shouldn't be around, but you continue to find yourself around them. And as well, it says this, it says, come back to your senses as you ought. Stop sinning. You know, I find that interesting because one of the things I realized as a young disciple is that when I was in sin, it was infinitely harder for me to want to talk about God. It was infinitely harder for me to want to help people. And it was infinitely harder for me to want to help myself. So this morning, if there is some sin in your life, I want to ask and plead with you to get the help that you need. I don't know what that's going to look like for each and every one of you. Because for each and every one of you, it's going to look different. But sin is something that you cannot mess around with. Sin is something that will take you out. And it will harden your heart if you let it. And the reason I know that is because for far too long, I thought that I could play with sin and still be in a good standing with God. I thought that I could play with my sin and me and God were still going to be good. Family, God can have nothing to do with sin. He's made it very clear to us. So if we have sin, we ought to make it our priority to get out of it. Right. But I don't, I don't want this to be for anybody else. Get out of it for yourself. Because here's the thing, family. Being in the church is amazing. Being around disciples is amazing. But I love all of you with all my heart. I love God more. And it took me a while to get there. But in my heart, I love God more. And because I love God more than all of you, I'm able to serve all of you. But I couldn't serve all of you if I didn't love God the way that I do. And that goes for all of us. We can't serve each other if we don't love ourselves enough 
to get the help that we need. Verse 13 says this. It says, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice, practice hospitality. You know, I want to lift up uh, Bob and Patty. There was like a three-week period where Bob and Patty were like, bro, you got to come over and let me feed you. And I was like, hey, man, I'm going to try to find the time to come over. And, and, I, and, and last week, or I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago at this point, man, it was a while ago. Amen. My, my weeks are starting to blend, amen? But we were, me and Chris and Brenda and Omar were able to go over there and, and just spend time with, with Bob and Patty. And I was able to hear Bob's heart, and, and he was really able to share with me. And, man, I remember having that conversation with Bob, and I was like, man, I, we got to get this brother speaking. And luckily, he was able to speak for us this morning, amen? But I also want to lift up uh, Cicero. Man, Cicero is like the first brother to let somebody in his house. He's like, bro, come on over, whenever. I want to lift up Paul and Sheila. They're willing at any point. Come on over. I mean, we're, we're lucky to have Paul and, Paul and Sheila. We wouldn't have no place to meet for midweek for a long time, amen? But I also want to lift up the Pinedos. AJ and CL are, man. If y'all want to know deeper, just talk to AJ and CL. They'll tell you the whole story, amen. But they embody this verse as well. But for our, for our, ad, uh, our family, our attitude is so important. It's what, it, it is what can keep us saved or pull us down spiritually. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 29. Ephesians chapter 29. Or, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Y'all about to hear a new verse. No, I'm joking. Don't tell me. I just misspoke. I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so, uh, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, family, I love this scripture because it doesn't leave any room for, for error so to speak. It said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And sometimes we think about that and we're like, well, you know, since I've become a disciple, I don't swear anymore and I don't say any inappropriate jokes anymore. So I'm good, right? I'm not letting any, any wholesome talk come out of my mouth. But let me ask you this question. How are you at building others up? How are you at helping people feel encouraged by your words. Because I'll be honest, I love joking around. Ask Omar. I do it to him a lot. I'm, Omar's probably nodding his head right now. It's almost, mm-hmm. Yeah, there it is, see? But as much as you joke around with somebody, you need to build them up just as much. And I'm not preaching to just you, I'm preaching to myself. This is an area I'm working on too. Yeah. AJ's going to help me with that, amen? But I'm, I'm telling all of you this too for two reasons. Number one, I'm not perfect. I need you guys to help me just as much as I need to help you. So because I'm not perfect, there's going to be some areas of my life that I need you guys to be like, hey, bro, that wasn't the nicest thing. That's why Courtney's in my life, amen? Sometimes Courtney will pull me aside and say, bro, what are you saying? You can't do that. And I'll look at her and I'm like, why not? It was true. She's like, yes, it was true, but it wasn't helpful. And I go, amen. And I just, at that point, I just have to bite my tongue. I can't, I can't say anything more after that. Amen. But I want to challenge us, family, to be zealous for God. 
but seize in our speech. Just because you're zealous doesn't mean that you have to become a brute or root. You can do both. You can be zealous and still build others up. It's not impossible. If anything, Jesus proved that it's possible. And so did the apostles. Amen? But I want to also call all of us to find one way this week that you can build someone up in your own Bible talk. But we're going to go a step further. This person in your Bible talk has to be somebody that you don't talk to on a normal basis. I think far too often we have our little friends, our little group, and we're like, oh, sis, I just just wanted to encourage you. And I'm like, sis, you encouraged her last week. What about the sisters you're not encouraging? Brothers be going up to sisters, hey, sis, I was thinking of you. Got you this candle. I, I know it's your favorite. But then that brother hasn't encouraged your brother ever. Don't be more encouraging. Don't be more encouraging to your interest than you are to, to the brothers, amen? Hey, if it don't apply to you, amen, you know? Point number three, your heart towards the lost. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. If uh if at any point you don't like anything that I said here today, you can take it up with God. Amen. <laughs> go straight to the source. Amen. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his, dis- to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field i love this verse and i love this scripture because it's very clear for us the issue of evangelizing the world has never been a harvest issue the issue has never been that there's not too little fruit the issue is that there's not enough workers. The issue is that God has people who he has hired on to work and they refuse to do so. They look at his labor as too burdensome. They look at his job as impossible. But why would God put in his very own words that the harvest is plentiful if it wasn't family? There's only two conclusions that we can draw from this matter. Either one, we need to repent if we are not working the harvest field. Or number two, Jesus is a liar and there's not a harvest for us to find. I don't know about you guys, but the option is for me that if I don't see a harvest, I need to work harder. Because I know that I know that my Jesus ain't no liar. Amen. But for all of us, and I mean all of us, we need to work the field. And all of for all of us, that's gonna look very different. If you are a single professional, it's gonna look different for you the way you share your faith compared to a to a mom or a family or a teen, or a campus student. It will look different. But just because it looks different doesn't mean that the harvest is less. The harvest is still there, family, but we have to be willing to work to see it. But another thing I gotta ask this morning is, are you a backseat driver? Are you a backseat disciple? 
I don't know if anybody's ever drove in or driven in a car with a backseat driver, but it's the most annoying thing ever. <laughs> hey, hey, bro, you're going to hit that. And you're like, no, I, I see it. Hey, bro, you know, you should probably turn this way. Hey, bro, you should probably do this. Hey, bro, you should probably do that. But yet they're not the ones who are driving. And as well, they never volunteer to drive. <laughs> we as disciples cannot be backseat disciples. Hey, bro, you should do this. Hey, bro, you should do that. Hey, sis, you should do this. Hey, sis, you should do that. But yet we don't do anything. As disciples, it is not wrong to help each other out. It is not wrong to say, hey, bro, I think you should do this differently. Or, hey, sis, I think you should do this differently. But what is wrong is when you're always the one critiquing, but you're never the one working. So for us, family, I don't want us to become a, a, a group of excuse makers. Mm -hmm. I would do more, but. I would have Bible studies, but. I would go to meetings of the body, but. Family, how are, how are we going to call people to be disciples if we are not living as disciples? It is, it is exceedingly difficult to be a disciple if we don't first live as disciples. I know for me, I can't do it in my conscience. I can't do it. I would feel too, I would just feel too convicted every single time. Like, man, I need to do this more. I need to do that more. So for us, family, let us not be those people, but let us go above and beyond what our call is. Amen. Let's go to James chapter two, verse 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. This is going to be our last verse of the day. Unless I uh, have an AJ moment. <laughs> this should be the last verse. Amen. Verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if we claim to have faith but, but has no deeds? I'm sorry, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If you say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but, uh, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous? For what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, not even uh, Rab, uh, Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteousness, a righteous, uh, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You know, family, we must accompany our faith in the Lord by our deeds. Let us stop talking and start doing. It takes no talent to share your faith. The reason I know this is because I do it. It takes no talent, family. 
Another reason I know this is because I could tell you story after story of how I went up to somebody, said everything wrong, and that person was open. And then I can tell you stories of how I had a detailed script of every single word I was going to say and their response. And they responded the exact way I thought they were going to respond. And then I responded the way that I was going to respond to the response. And they were still not open. <laughs> it doesn't take talent. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, although that does help. But what it does take is it takes a willing heart to act on your faith. And that's really what God is calling us to do. If you say you believe in God, if you say you have faith in him, act on your faith. One of the most radical things you guys can do as a disciple, the most radical thing that any of us, we, uh, that any of us can do as a disciple is be consistent. Family. All the sermons that we've heard this year are not things that we need to do for a moment. They're things that we need to do for a lifetime. You know, it takes boldness to open your mouth. It's scary to talk to a stranger. And that's why I want to challenge you to find somebody in your Bible talk to be a prayer partner, but also a sharing partner. And go out and share with that person every day. Hold each other accountable but also build each other up because some days are not going to go as well as others. In closing, family, God is waiting for you to give him your heart and, we, uh, and, and trust him uh, and, and trust in him. I'm sorry. In Matthew 6, verse 30, at the, at the end of this verse, it says, oh, you of little faith, in response to when we worry. When we worry, family, we're saying that God is not big enough to handle our problems. <clears throat> and that's a scary sight. That's a scary scene to, say, to see. When you no longer believe that God can move in your heart. You no longer believe God can move in your life. But I don't believe that that's where we're at, family. I believe that we are, we are going to change and we are going to give God our whole heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to leave you with four challenges today. Challenge number one, give your whole heart to God in every aspect of your life. Challenge number two, find one area to be more zealous. Challenge number three, find one way to encourage someone in your Bible talk this week. And challenge number four, find one person in find one person to study the Bible week Bible with this week. If we do these things, we will see that the, the West will be set ablaze. Our sizzling faith will no longer be producing embers, but they will be producing fires that no one can put out, not even Satan. And if that's what we can do here in the West, imagine what we can do if every single person in the West, in the whole Chicago church, just adopts this. Give your whole heart to God. Man, I can't wait to see that day. And I hope you guys feel the same. Because when we see that day, Man, it's going to be a, a sight to behold. Lord, guys, I love you so much. I, I, I want to I thank you for all of your hard work this year so far. And I just want to ask that you would continue to give God your heart. And in every single area, it, whether it's in your speech or whatever, continue to push forward with giving God your heart. Because God desires your heart so much. I love you, family, and to God be all the glory.